Okay, well, thanks for coming out. Uh, it's good to know who are the people who really care about the <laughs> facility. Apparently, I should not have put mandatory and quotation marks in the email yesterday. Uh, anyway, uh, what I want to talk to you about today, I don't think this will take too long, uh, but I just want to go through a few general guidelines that are kind of applicable to all of the microscopes or most of the microscopes in the facility. <coughs> And then after that, I'm going to talk about some more microscope-specific guidelines. So I'll just talk about a couple different systems. Um, mainly, I'm just going to concentrate on things that we notice either week in and week out, or have noticed, uh, that really annoy Sven and Dave and I. Uh, but you will see this slide, a variation from this slide, at least three times through this presentation. And if you don't take anything away from us today, Take this. If you think something's broken or something's not working right, just come and tell us. If you think there's some oil on an objective, come and find one of us and let us know. We're not around, send us an email. We'll look at it right away. Because um, this is the worst, is when something is like kind of broken but not really broken, and then we go through two weeks of people getting crappy images off a microscope before we actually notice it. Um, so if you think something's not right, just come and let us know. I know a lot of people are worried that if they break something, we're going to call their PI and say, you owe us grand and fix this. Um, if you tell us right away, we'll never do that. Uh, when, if you break something, it's on us because we didn't train you properly, OK? Um, if you don't tell us that you broke something, until we find out a couple weeks later who it was, then that's when we have a discussion with the PI, OK? So just try and be as upfront as possible. <laughs> Right, so first thing, how do you turn the microscope on? Um, so this is pretty straightforward, but with all of our systems, you want to make sure that the power to the microscope is turned on first before you turn on the computer. And so usually the systems have one of these um, power switch boxes, or we have everything plugged into one or two power strips, usually on the legs of the air table. Uh, so just make sure that you get the power to the microscope turned on first before you turn on the computer. There's a few systems that won't recognize the components properly if that isn't done. Okay? And then whenever there's one of these white power switch boxes, you just start from the top and work your way down, and from left to right. Okay? That's the correct order for these. So turning on is, is pretty straightforward. Uh, turning off is where you can run into a few problems. So the first thing I want to point out is just only turn it off when it's really necessary. So electronic equipment, the more times it goes turned on and turned off, uh, the worse that is for the system. You're more likely to break something just in the turning on and turning off process. So uh, we always tell everybody when we're training you, if there's someone coming after you later in the day, just leave the microscope on. Don't turn anything off. Just log out of Windows. That's all you have to do. Um, if the software crashes, try restarting the software again before you try turning everything on, okay? So we want to go through as few of these on-off cycles as we can. Um, but the absolute most important thing when you're shutting it down is make sure that this computer is completely off before you hit the power switch. And don't watch the monitor, because the monitor will go black before the computer is shut off, okay? So you want to watch, there's a little white or blue light right here on the computer. And you want to wait until that light goes off before you hit those power switches. Um, so when you turn the power switches off before the computer is off, you <coughs> often either corrupt your account, and then the next time you try to start up Zen, it won't start up for you. Uh, the other thing you can do is screw up the RAID array, especially on the light sheet. It goes into the protection mode, and no one can use the microscope again until we get in the BIOS of the RAID array. Okay. So this is the, the most important thing when it comes to shutting down, is make sure that that computer is off before you hit any power switches. The other thing that's important is any microscope that's using uh, an argon laser, so you'll see these big black boxes on, mostly on the confocals. Uh, this is your 458, 488, and 514 lines on the confocals. And you also want to be careful that this has enough time to cool down when you're turning it off. Right? 
So on most of our confocals now, um, a lot of this is controlled through Zen, through the software. But the Lyra and the Pascal still have this extra little box. So when you're shutting this down, the first thing you want to do is the opposite of when you turn it on, is switch this little toggle switch down to the bottom. Uh, the next thing you want to do is turn this key to the off position. And then what you're going to do is wait until you hear the fan shut off. Okay. Uh, so there's going to be a fan on the back of this power supply that's going to be running. You want to wait till that shuts off. On the systems that don't have this little box, you just do that in Zen. So when you exit Zen, it's the exact same thing as flipping the switch down and hitting this key. And then after about three or four minutes, you'll hear this fan turn off. Right. So you want to wait until the computer's off. You want to wait until this fan is off. And then there's also another power switch under here. You can actually leave that one on all the time. You never have to worry about switching that off. But then you're going to want to hit the main power switch. And just like before, we're going to do these in the reverse order. So now we're going to go right to left and bottom to top. Okay. So pretty straightforward. So this is one that we never, I realize we never tell you about this when we're doing training, and we probably should. Uh, but thankfully, it's never really happened in the facility since I've been here. We've had a couple of spikes, but we've never had a power failure. But uh, just so let you know, if the power does fail, if you're on one of these three systems, so the 700, the Pascal, or the Axia Zoom, uh, that microscope's just gonna shut off and you're gonna lose everything. Uh, so these aren't on any battery backups, okay? So there's nothing that you can do if you're on one of those systems. Uh, if you're using any of our confocals, the two photon, the bomb, the flat tag, the Lyra, or the Axio scan, uh, these are all on battery backups, UPS systems, but they only probably have about five to 15 minutes of battery life, depending on what you're doing. So you've got five to 15 minutes to save your data and shut down that system before it shuts down for you. Okay. Uh, so if power ever does fail when you're on one of those systems, you want to try and get your data saved and get it shut down as quickly as you can. Finally, if you are on the light sheet or the cell discoverer, these are on battery backups and they're also plugged into the emergency power generator. <coughs> so if you're on one of these two systems and the power fails, you don't have to worry, you're going to be able to continue. Okay? Um, the reason that these two are on that is mostly because of when the facility was built, there's only a few plugs in the facility that were put on emergency generator power. Um, they're all regular voltage, so the confocals all require higher voltage, so none of them can go on that. Uh, and then they're only placed in like two spots in the entire room. So uh, we figured these two systems are most likely to be used for long-term live cell imaging. So they've been placed close to those battery backup headlets. Uh, they also don't, they just use a regular voltage out of, out of the wall. Uh, so those are why those two are, you're able to, to keep working. Cool. So now probably this is our worst, the most, the mistake that we find most often in the facility. And Sven actually had a great idea today. He had suggested that we not give you any plates or napkins today so that you could feel what our hands feel like every week. <laughs> So this is uh, the control screen from the LSM 700. It shows you all the objectives that you have on here. So for the 40X, the 63, and the 100X, what type of immersion media are you going to put on those objectives? Well, good job. That tells you right there. What about the 10 and the 20 here? What are you going to put on those ones? Oil. Nothing. Way to go. <laughs> uh, what about the 25X? What are you going to put on there? I heard water, I heard glycerol. Um, the truth is, this is actually a multi-immersion objective. So it, it says water here, but you can actually do water, glycerol, or oil um, on this objective. But there is a correction color on the objective, which should be adjusted for that. So 
Um, for pretty well all of the objectives in the facility, what you see underneath here is going to be absolutely correct. Uh, there's, I think this 25x might be the only exception to that. Uh, so everything else should tell you exactly what goes on there. But it is not this simple. So if you walk around the facility, you will now find five different bottles of immersion media that are sitting around the facility. Okay. So uh, the first three here are all fairly similar. So they all say 518F. So this is standard oil immersion. So those are refractive index of 1.518. But you can see a couple of them are corrected for temperatures. So this is if you're doing some live cell imaging at 30 degrees Celsius or 37 degrees Celsius, you want to switch to those. And that's because as the temperature changes, the refractive index of that uh, media also changes. So you want to have uh, an oil that is matched to the temperature that you're going to be working at. Uh, over here we have this Immersol G. Um, so G stands for glycerin or glycerol. So that's what you want to use if you're using a glycerol immersion objective. And then finally on the far side we have Immersol W. And this is for water immersion objectives. It's actually glycerol based as well, so it won't evaporate like if you just put water on the objective. Um, but it has the same refractive index as water, so it's 1.33. Okay. And these all, um, aside from the lettering on the label, they're also coded uh, on the top of the bottle. So the regular oil just has no stickers on it. The 30 and 37 degrees have a sticker that tells you which temperature they're for. Uh, glycerol just has a white sticker with no numbers on it, and then the water ones all have a light blue sticker. Okay. So you should be able to, just by looking at the top of it, know what you've got um, and which one you're going to be using. <coughs> Alright, so now what happens if you leave the lid off of one of these? There's two things that are going to happen. See that one? Spill. Yeah, so obvious one is the next person's going to come and knock it over and spill it everywhere. Um, the one that's a little less obvious is these oils are hygroscopic, so they're actually going to absorb water out of the air. That's going to change the refractive index of that oil, and your imaging is not going to look as good. Okay? So uh, we do a couple things to try and prevent this. One, we screw the caps on whenever we see them left off. Uh, the other thing we do is we usually try not to fill the bottles all the way. Um, this is Dave is fantastic at doing this, <laughs> making sure that there's only about half an inch of oil in the bottom of them. And then what that does is if it falls over, hopefully it doesn't spill as badly. Uh, but it also means that we're refreshing that oil a little more often so that the water that's coming into it um, doesn't really change that our eyes. Um, but you always want to make sure that you screw those caps back on nice and tight when you're done. Okay, so the next problem comes along when you're changing between objectives. Uh, and this, going from an air objective to an oil objective, you really never any issues there. But it's when you want to go back the other way. And I am totally guilty of this, I do this all the time as well. Um, but we really need to stop doing this. So this is looking into the Elyra, so I think this is a 63X oil. Um, so let's say you want to go from this 100x oil objective to this 10x air objective just so that you can reposition your sample and, and find something that's interesting. Um, before you do that, there's two things you want to do. You want to remove the oil from the objective and you also want to move, remove the oil from your slide. So just get a kim wipe and wipe those both off. The reason for that is even if you're just switching really quickly, when this objective moves over to another position, it's no longer sitting straight up and down anymore. It's on a bit of an angle. And what that means is the oil that's left on there runs off the side and runs down and gets inside the objective. Okay? Once the oil gets inside the objective, there's nothing we can do. We have to send it back to the ice to, to get it prepared. All right. um, the other reason you want to get it off your slide is some of that oil is going to stay on the objective, some of it's going to stay on your slide. And if you go to an air objective, um, 
probably not with the 10x here, but definitely with the 20. It has a short enough working distance, but it's going to just bump right into that oil. And that oil is going to go right inside the 20x here. Okay. Um, so to prove this, I went over to the Elabora yesterday and took an image with the 20x objective. Um, so this is just endothelial cells with the active label in cyan and the um, no, mitochondrial So I took this image, looked okay, unscrewed the objective, looked at it, sure enough, there's oil smeared all across it. Um, so I cleaned it off and then took the exact same image. And hopefully what you can see is this one's a lot brighter. Um, and if you actually start to look into some of these, if you zoom in, you can actually see a little bit more detail, especially in the acting structures. Um, but just to, to quantitate this a little bit, here's the mean intensity of pixels um, across this image. It's about 3,000 counts. And then if you go over to this one, you're getting 4,500 counts. So it's a pretty dramatic increase in the amount of signal that you got there. Um, and I didn't have to smear oil on it, it was already there. Uh, so pretty much every week, we clean the microscopes on Tuesday and Wednesday mornings. Every 10x and 20x objective has oil on it. Um, every Tuesday and Wednesday morning. So that means that unless you're the first user after Tuesday and Wednesday morning, your images probably look like this when they could look like this. Okay. Sorry, we can't clean them every day. <laughs> so if you do think something is dirty, um, come and find us. And the big reason for this is these 10 and 20 X objectives, uh, the actual front lens is concave. So if you just try, uh, we have some lens cleaner and stuff like that around the facility. If you try and just squirt some of that on some lens paper and try and wipe it off yourself, uh, the trouble is, is you can't really get down inside there. Um, so uh, I often have people come and say, I think there's some oil on the objective, but I tried to wipe it off and it didn't change anything. And then when I take it off, I can see that it's still there. Uh, so it's really tough to get that oil out of the, like, the 10 and the 20x objectives because you have to get down inside there. Uh, so we do this with platinum swabs. Um, there's also some of these, there's a little uh, first aid kit for dirty objectives by the clearing, um, the X-Clarity system when you first walk into the facility on your right hand side. Uh, so there are some cotton swabs in there, but really it's tough to do it when it's in place. Usually you need like four or five cotton swabs to get everything off of it. So it's easiest just to come and ask one of us. Uh, it takes us a bit of five minutes to, to clean it up for you. So as a random aside, um, this is an image of a front lens of an objective. It was a really old one that we beat up on software's website. It's a really um, inter interesting little study that this guy did and posted it up on, on his website. So these are just a whole bunch of scratches. There's actually a bunch of chunks of glass that have been taken out of here. Um, so you can see it's, it's badly damaged and really beat up. So my question to you is, what's going to be worse, this scratched up objective or an objective that has some oil smeared across it? Who votes for scratches? Who votes for oil? So um, this one here is like, like, you would never find an objective like this in our facility. Thank you. Um, you might find, uh, we definitely do have a couple that have some thin scratches here and there. Uh, and the truth is, is that oil smeared across it is way worse. Uh, the reason for that is, if you think of an objective, it's, its resolution and its ability to make a nice image basically all relies on the um, cone of light that can get into that objective. So basically, how many angles of light can make it into that objective. If you've got a thin scratch sort of down the middle or going across it, it's only affecting a very few of those nearly infinite angles of light that are coming into the objective. Okay? Whereas if you've got oil smeared across the whole thing, it's affecting every single angle of light that's coming into that objective. And so it's actually a lot worse to have oil smeared across it than to have a couple small scratches on it. Okay. Um, so another thing that 
uh, we see from time to time uh, is overexposing the detectors. Uh, so the, the systems that are the most sensitive to this are any systems that have a gas detector. So this is all of the 880s, 880 confocals, uh, as well as the EMCCD camera. Uh, so there's two of those on the Elira, and there's also one on the LSM 700. Um, so basically, if you're trying to image this image that I took the other day, but on your screen it looks like this, you have overexposed your detector. Uh, on the 880s and on this camera on the 700, they actually have an emergency shutter, so you're going to hear a click. Uh, the EMCCD will really beat loudly and annoyingly at you and tell you you're a terrible person. Um, the gas detectors won't do that. They'll just shut off. There's a tiny little error message that pops up at the bottom of the set, but it won't let you continue imaging until you uh, stop the image and restart it. And so, because of this, I was like, <laughs> using these detectors, or basically any detectors on the confocal or any EMCCD cameras, always start with your laser power and your gains just right down to the bottom, uh, and just slowly start to increase those until you see signals so that you don't have to worry about overexposing. Uh, the other thing that you have to be careful about is whatever focal plane you start on might not be the brightest focal plane in your ZSAC. So make sure that you go all the way through that ZSAC <coughs> and make these adjustments of the brightest plane in your sample. Okay. Um, this, when this happens, this does, over time, decrease the sensitivity of the detectors. Um, so, Sven and I have noticed recently, like, the 880 ARI scan right now, the detectors on there aren't nearly as sensitive as they were when I first got here. Um, so thankfully, we have a new one on the way that should be here in January or February. Um, but over time, the more these things get hit with a lot of light, uh, the less sensitive they become. Okay. Now, I'm sure you have seen my barrage of emails of the five objectives that we've trashed in the last year. And I'm pretty sure this is how it happens. Um, it's through contact with the different stages. And the reason I say that is the two systems that happen most frequently on, the Elira, or the three systems, the Elira, the AD the Air Scan, and the old cell observer, were systems where we were often changing stages. Um, so I think this is most likely why this is happening. So one of my pet peeves is when I come in in the morning and see this. So it's someone who is obviously imaging with just a regular slide. But for some reason, they had this pushed all the way over to the side and had the objective right up at the edge here. Um, <clears throat> just make sure that when you're done, like obviously, if, if you have to do this, you have to do this. But when you're done, move the stage so that this objective is centered again. Because the next person's going to come in here and they're not going to look. They're going to drop their slide on there, bang the objective. They're going to switch objectives, and this filter wheel's going to objective wheel is going to spin, and now all of these objectives are dangerously close to the edge of that stage, um, especially if they're too high up. So just always recenter this back to the middle when you're done. Uh, just like this. Okay. So the other thing that you can see here So what I want to do is show you. Um, 
the microscope here. These little clamps on either side, as long as you leave those loose, what you can hopefully see here is I'm focusing up with this objective and it's just lifting the slide up. Now I'm going back down. So as long as you don't tighten those clamps on either side, if you focus too high, you don't have to worry about damaging anything. It's just going to lift that slide up. Okay. Um, so the other thing that you have to watch out for if you're focusing too high um, is you can see there's another objective right here. So if this one goes too high, just lifts up your slide because you didn't have this clamp, that's fine. This one here runs right into this big metal piece. Okay? I think this is where a lot of the damage is happening. Um, so when you're focusing too high and not paying attention, you ran this guy. Now with this stage insert right here, uh, this isn't held in. There's a little spring in the corner here that doesn't hold it in too tightly. So probably all that's going to happen is that's just going to pop out. So we're probably not going to get any damage there. But if you're using something different, that might not happen. So here's a, a multi-well insert. So here's a multi-well plate. Let's say we're trying to look at this well right here on the absolute outside. If I take that plate away, you can see now how close this objective is to the edge of that insert. And again, if you focus up too high here, this is going to start rubbing on the edge of the objective. Okay? And that's quite likely to do some damage. Uh, especially if you have, say, one of the 63X objectives that have a very short working distance. They're right up against this and they're really close to that edge. Um, so for that reason, uh, don't use the outside wells of 96 well plates. Okay? For one, you probably can't image the entire well anyway. Um, a lot of the inserts don't allow you to get that close to it, and you really run the risk of, of damaging your objective. Right. Now, a lot of the live cell systems have these heated inserts. So this is one of our older ones that has a round cut out in the middle. Uh, the newer ones have rectangular cut outs here. And once again, you want to make sure that the objective is in the middle before you put this stage insert in. So I often see this, that uh, the objective is way over to the side, and then someone tries to drop one of these in, it lands right on the objective. Okay? So make sure you first center the stage of the objective before you drop this insert in. And then once you've got your sample on there, you have to be really careful when you're moving left and right and up and down because you don't have as much space now um, before that objective runs into this metal ring around the outside. Okay? And again, if you've got an oil version objective, you're really up nice and close, if this comes across, it's going to scratch right across the front lens of the objective. So you have to be really, really careful with these live cell stages. Uh, and again, if you focus too high with this one, that other objective over there is going to drive right in. These ones are really heavy, so it's not going to just pop it out. It's probably going to do some damage to that objective. Uh, the other thing is we have these lids that go on those um, heated inserts. So this is when you're typing in your CO2 and humidified air. Uh, there's a design flaw in these, that this piece of glass that's inside them likes to drop out. Uh, so Sven and I have both had this happen to us. We pick it up, glass falls out, it's smashed. Right. Um, so you need to be really careful when you're picking these lids up and just try and support that glass or at least turn it over so that um, it's upside down and then the glass isn't going to fall out of it. Right now, the only system we have these on right now is the ADAD Airy Scan. Um, the new one that's coming in the new year, I ordered with a different cover, so hopefully we aren't going to have this problem anymore. Um, but this is something that you have to watch out for. The other thing that you can do is when these are on the microscope, you know the um, when you're loading your sample, you tilt back the top of the microscope with the condenser in it. If that condenser is too low, when you bring it back down, it will hit this glass and punch it out as well. Um, so when you're tilting that head of the microscope back, you have to be careful that you don't hit that glass and over. All right. And another note about stages on the upright microscopes. So here's a, a petri dish. 
Um, here's our dipping objective. And you can see here's the, the buffer is filled up to about halfway in this petri dish. Here's the common petri dish. So uh, for those of you who haven't used one of the uprights, um, our objective is up above here, and then right up here there's a little knob that you turn, and that drops the objective down into the solution, okay, or into your buffer. So if this buffer is right up at the very top here, and you drop that objective down, what happens to the buffer? Spills over the top and goes all over the condenser down below. Okay. So this is another one we're always cleaning condensers every week because people dip into these overflow over the side all over the condenser. So this is a, a perfect example. There's lots of space here. It's only filled about halfway. It's not going to be a problem. Now. Um, you may have noticed we have these chillers around the facility now as well. So these are on all the 880s. The light sheet also has one. Uh, sometimes you'll hear a really annoying beeping sound from these. And there'll be a little red light on here, a little flash. Uh, it usually happens when you first turn on the system, and then it'll keep going. If that ever happens, come find one of us. We just need to top up the coolant inside there. Uh, if it's middle of the night, you're doing an experiment at 2 in the morning, don't worry about it, just send us an email. You'll be fine for the night. We'll top it up the next morning when we get in. Um, but uh, make sure you, you give us an email. You'll have to deal with the annoying beeping sound while you're doing your experiment, but it's not going to destroy the microscope. Um, cool, so just uh, a couple last few slides specifically about some of the microscopes. So this is the Elira stage if you're looking out from the inside. So there's a really big bulky insert that you can't really see because I took this picture with my really old phone. Um, but there's a big bulky insert here that can lift out. Don't ever touch that. If that pops out, we have to realign the entire system for it to work again. Um, but what there are inside here is these four little metal tabs that the stage inserts drop down and sit on. Uh, so these are the stage inserts. You've got one for standard microscope slides and then one for 35 millimeter dishes. And these just sit down onto those little tabs. So these should be the only thing that you ever take in or out of the microscope. Okay? And again, if you're using this 35 millimeter round dish one, be careful. Uh, you really can't move that stage at all. The objective almost fills the entire center. Um, if you do ever notice that the stage, when you go to drop that insert in, you might notice the stage wobbling back and forth. Again, come let us know, because we've we got to realign the whole system. And it's going to take about half an hour or an hour to do that. Um, I mentioned this earlier, just with these argon lasers, just make sure you're shutting these down properly. Um, so these are the ones on the Elyra and Pascal. <laughs> This is a good one. Um, this was, I was at home one night, I got an email around 11.30, someone said the Axios scan had jammed. Um, so they said they were done for the night, so I came in the next morning to take a look at it. And this is what I found inside the microscope. This actually isn't the slide. So if you recognize the slide as yours, uh, it wasn't even the business, but. Uh, so what I found was this slide inside. So I, I got it in the microscope, got it on jam, digging around, looking all over inside the microscope for the rest of the slide. Can't find it anywhere. I uh, talked to the user, and I also realized that this was actually being held in the Axioscan slide holder backwards. So the label, this, this end was where the label was written. Um, so it turns out the, the rest of this never existed. They actually tried to put a broken slide into the system. Um, and so don't ever do that. Uh, basically, make sure you have a full intact slide. Uh, and when you put them into the holders in the Axios Scan 2, make sure they're fitting in nice and proper. So oftentimes what I'll do is we have that automatic slide loader. So once you eject from that, I still put my thumbs on every label and just pull it down to make sure that it's sitting flat and it's right at the bottom. Um, make sure you don't wrap any stickers or tape or anything around the edge of the slider where it keeps helping the microphone. Definitely don't put the broken slide. The Axiosum, um, 
this has a safety on it, but I've reset recently, so hopefully it should be okay now. Uh, we just got a new system in a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but the biggest damage that you can do with this system is if you um, drive the focus motor too low, you can actually drive the objectives through the glass plate here. Um, we've had this happen many times. Uh, most often what happens is there are two objectives on the system and someone will be looking at the objective that they're using at the front here, but the objective that's at the back is actually a longer objective and they don't realize that that one's going through the glass plate. Okay? Um, so just if you're using the system, be sure you're aware of which objective you're using, where the longest objective is, uh, and make sure it doesn't get down too close um, to the plate. They all have pretty long working distances on them, so other than the 2.3x, they should never be all that close to the bottom anyway. Um, but something else to keep an eye on. Uh, on the light sheet, the one thing it's, it's possible to damage your sample more likely and possibly the stage um, when you're doing rotations. So when you have your glass capillary in here, you have two options for how to rotate this. So there's one that says center of image and there's one that says drive axis. If you want to be safe, just always switch this over to drive axis. I don't know why this isn't the default, but it's not. Um, so always switch it over to drive axis and then all that's going to do is it's going to rotate the capillary wherever it is, but it's not going to move it in X, Y, or Z. Okay? Um, if you have it on the center of image, what it does is as, it, as you rotate the capillary here, it tries to keep it positioned in your field of view. So it actually moves an X and Y, or sorry, X and Z. Um, and if this isn't near the middle, if the capillary isn't near the middle, it actually tries to do some really dramatic swings with that capillary. So it's always safest just to do this on drive axis. Uh, and the other thing you want to do is when you're all done, make sure you hit this load position button before <coughs> you pull the sample chamber out. So if you don't move the um, capillary in your sample all the way up to the top, when you pull out the chamber, you snap off the capillary. Okay? So you usually find flash shards in there quite often. Save. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to say, there's one image that I tried to put in here, but downloaded from the cloud. Um, so if you're using positions in Zen Blue, so this is on the Axio Zoom and the Cell Discoverer. I don't think this this shouldn't be a problem on the Cell Discoverer anymore because it should have some anti-collision protection to it. But this can happen on the Zoom. If you add a bunch of positions uh, one day, you come back the next week. Those positions are still saved in Zen Blue. It doesn't get rid of those um, from experiment to experiment. So you have to go in and delete all of your positions from the last experiment before you add your new ones. Okay? Uh, and if you don't do that, as soon as you hit start experiment, it starts going to your old positions, and that may move your sample somewhere that's going to cause some damage. Right? So I think this was a big problem on our, the old cell observer quite often. Um, it's usually not too big of a problem on the Zoom, because like I said, the, the sample usually isn't anywhere near the objective. Um, but just something to keep in mind, make sure you delete those old positions and you just come back to do your next experiment. And finally, uh, when you're saving your data, um, always save to the D drives, or one of our workstations has a D drive. Um, just make sure you're always saving your data here and not to the C drive. If we get too much data on the C drive, it becomes unstable. That's where Zen lives. We want Zen to be as stable as it can be. Um, and always just save one file at a time. If you try to save multiple files, especially if they're big, Zen often doesn't like that. Um, and when you're using Zen Black, uh, don't use the autosave function. Use the, the streaming function. Uh, so this should help. Um, keep the stability of the, the computer and also help in, in saving your data so that you don't lose anything. And so finally, just remember if, if there is something that looks broken or doesn't seem right, or you think you might have broken something, come let us know right away. Um, we're more than happy to try and fix it quickly as opposed to finding anything.
Cool. So thanks so much for coming out. Um, if you got any questions, let us know. Um, otherwise, this was the last bunch of learning this term. Um, we'll probably see you again in the spring. Uh, we usually take next week off. And if you got any suggestions, anything you'd like to see us do, send me an email. Okay. Uh, <laughs>